Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's Hello. webinar, uh, What to Expect at the 2014 Health Center and Public Housing National Symposium. My name is Rachel Logan. I am the Training and Technical Assistance Manager at the National Center for Health and Public Housing, and I am joined by Casey Ulrich from Community Health Partners for Sustainability, as well as Dr. Little from NARSA and Ms. Cynthia Davis from the Floating Hospital. Who we are. At the National Center for Health and Public Housing and Community Health Partners for Sustainability, we provide training and technical assistance to health centers serving low-income populations, special populations such as residents in public housing and other safety net providers Amen. funded in part by NARSA. <clears throat> I'm on a conference. So overall, the two and a half day training symposium, um, which will be held June 10th through 12th in Alexandria, Virginia at the Westin Hotel, um, will focus on three major areas, program development and analysis, performance improvement, as well as uh, clinical quality issues. Um, the two and a half days will feature experts in the field. Um, national speakers, federal speakers, um, state and local agencies, as well as health centers. So we are going to have health centers and residents of public housing participating in sessions and providing information to attendees. Um, so you have a lot to expect. Some different features that we have this year um, are lunch plenary with HUD as well as United Community and State. They are an insurer, um, a health insurance program. Um, and they provide health insurance, specifically Medicaid, for this department. And they'll speak to their role and involvement in the community at the local levels with helping low-income residents um, receive health care. Um, so we'll discuss that with them. And we also will be offering CHES CEUs, which we have not offered in the past. But we are seeing an increase in the number of public health professionals who um, need that accreditation and those credentials. So we are offering that. And one unique feature that I'm very excited about is our community forum, which will host uh, a speaker from HRSA, um, two men who run a men's health center in Chicago, as well as a resident from DC Public Housing, and a couple of other individuals who will kind of form this discussion around how do we address the continuing need of low-income populations um, at all levels. So how do you incorporate the federal regulations, the national um, initiatives, as well as very local issues that are relevant to specific populations. Um, and then we also will coincide that with a live Twitter chat as well. And so we'll have a forum online as well as an in-person forum for those who are able to join us in Alexandria. So I will pass it over to Casey now. Thank you very much, Rachel. I appreciate that. Um, and again, I'm Casey Ulrich. I'm the Director of Programs here at uh, Community Health Partners for Sustainability. And again, we're uh, very excited to be uh, presenting this uh, training symposium in conjunction with North American Management again this year. Uh, we think it's a great partnership, and uh, it's been successful in the past, and we're looking forward to a successful event this June. So thinking about who should attend, uh, first off, this is the only national training symposium specifically for uh, health centers and other safety net clinics that are serving residents of public housing. So as such, uh, it's a great event and a must-attend event for PHPC grantees, um, FQHCs, that are funded specifically to serve and reach out to um, public housing residents. Uh, it's also a great forum for other grant-supported health centers so that other FQHCs may be serving homeless populations, migrant health populations, as well as look-alike clinics. Uh, much of the content of this year's symposium is about uh, growing your health center, meeting your HRSA requirements, so it's a natural fit for those health centers as well. Uh, beyond that, other safety net clinics have been regular attendees at our events in the past and have come away very pleased with it. It's great to learn, uh, again, the fundamentals of operating, growing, sustaining a health center that um, relate to any health center, not just those with uh, federal recognition. 
and also for those health centers that are thinking about maybe becoming a federally qualified health center or a look-alike. Uh, there's a lot of work that needs to be done in the run-up to that, and uh, this is a great event for those safety net clinics. As we mentioned, there are a lot of housing authorities that have attended our events in the past and uh, are a great fit. It's a terrific opportunity for representatives of public housing authorities to attend, maybe in conjunction with a health center member in their service area, uh, to attend together, think about growth opportunities, um, opportunities for joint programming, um, and then other resident advocates. It's great to have you there uh, to hear, have your voices heard, uh, to get the input and the valuable insight of residents is always appreciated. Other social service agencies, um, uh, many of whom may not have a singular focus on housing, uh, but housing, of course, is a major component of any work that you're doing. So um, thinking of those who are out there working on behalf of migrants, who are working on behalf of children and families, um, housing and health are obviously a major component and uh, have also attended in the past. And then we always have lots of attendees from foundations, uh, folks who are funding health services, housing initiatives, joint programming, um, and then health profession and public health students. Uh, this is a great opportunity, especially if you're um, you know, in uh, the midst of your schooling. It's a great opportunity to see exactly what health centers are all about, the work that they do, the populations they work with, um, you know, the difficulties and the benefits associated with working in a health center, uh, it's a great way to build up that uh, that network. Um, you know, to put you one step closer to a paid position once you graduate, which is something that we all know is very useful. Um, in addition to who should attend, um, you know, one group that uh, we don't have the list there, but we always have lots of representatives from primary care associations and from regional extension centers. So those who are working with health centers on a daily basis, uh, they've attended in the past. Some of them have been involved with our presentations, and they're always a welcome addition. So um, thinking about who's going to be at our symposium this June, uh, on this slide you see just a few of the logos and names of organizations that will be attending um, and presenting in some capacity. Um, obviously, HRSA um, and HUD are great to have on board, giving their perspective as grant-making institutions and as valuable partners. Um, other federal agencies and large community groups uh, we're very happy to have, uh, especially the District of uh, Columbia Primary Care Association. Some other organizations that will be involved, national organizations, include the National Association of Community Health Centers, NAC. Um, they're going to be involved in a couple uh, plenary discussions, uh, and they always have uh, some great insight and. Um, insider information to share with the group. Uh, in addition to that national organization, we also have the National Healthcare for the Homeless Council um, involved in this year's event, as well as the Center for Budget and Policy Priorities. So those are two great uh, national organizations that are going to be involved. And then in addition to the um, national representatives, there are also advocacy groups and uh, training representatives that are that you should keep in mind. Um, some of those who will be uh, presenting include the National Center for Medical Legal Partnerships. That's uh, a, a, an area that I know many health centers are interested in exploring, developing medical legal partnerships. And so uh, there will be someone from that organization who will be presenting. Um, health outreach partners, for those of you who are working with uh, migrant uh, farm workers and other populations, there are terrific resources as well as the Association of Clinicians for the Underserved. Many of you may have participated in their training events in the past, but they do a terrific job, especially around chronic care management, things like that. So um, really one of the benefits of this symposium is just having all of these great minds from great organizations in one place, and it's your opportunity to really corner them uh, in between sessions and really pick their brains and uh, build that relationship so that you can go back to them in the future for assistance, for training, um, and uh, to really kind of grow your network and uh, build support for your health center. So uh, we'll go to the next slide. I wanted to talk a little bit about the sessions that we have. As Rachel mentioned, um, we have three major topic areas uh, for our symposium this year. 
uh, we'll be looking at fiscal and program management. And by fiscal and program management, uh, what we're talking about there are things like um, collaborative care relationships, the financial management of your health center, emergency preparedness, and um, workforce development, all very critical to the ongoing health of any health center. Uh, performance improvement is another topic area. Uh, and by that, we mean kind of primary care and enabling services, so chronic disease and nutrition, prevention and wellness, um, violence and trauma, uh, mental health and substance abuse, which of course are uh, of uh, increasing priority for our health centers, and then as well as operation, operational and administrative aspects of performance improvement. So that would be your quality improvement initi initiatives, case management, uh, and your innovative models of care. And then finally, our third overall area relates to program development and analysis. So grant funding and audits, growing um, financial capital um, and space for new programs, being coming involved in research and data, partnering with academic institutions, and community outreach and enrollment, which leads us to um, our uh, theme for this year's National Symposium, which is um, engaging residents of underserved communities from outreach to quality care. Uh, we chose that theme this year really because there is a new kind of paradigm in how health centers are working with their, um, with their communities. Uh, and it involves more than just being a place for them to come to when they're feeling ill, when they need something. It really has become a model where you are reaching out into the community. You're constantly in a dialogue with the community to see what services they need, how you can better serve uh, these individuals and especially in a new, more competitive marketplace. It's something that all health centers need to really be thinking about is, how can I make my health center more competitive? How can I make it um, a more welcoming, uh, desirable place to go for care, uh, especially as, uh, as insurance is expanded, um, as we want to see greater productivity and um, have greater number of services delivered at our health center? How do we get those patients um, into our door on a more regular basis and to really build that foundation for improved quality of care and improved care outcomes. So that's the basis on which we developed our agenda. And we're excited about the activities that are going to be involved, uh, the, the sessions and the activities that are uh, presented in the agenda. I encourage everybody to go to our, our website, take a look at the, the agenda in depth. But I'll point out just a few uh, that we're very excited about. Um, one, uh, right there, the ESPERT, the Screening Brief Treatment for Alcohol and Illicit Drug Use. Um, that is a um, uh, workshop session, uh, one that we're very excited about because there have been some major funding initiatives around the use of ESPERT in the primary care setting. So we think that that's one that uh, many health center representatives are going to be eager to attend. We also have um, some great breakout sessions around uh, chronic disease management, um, the management of diabetes and asthma, uh, something that a lot of health centers are seeing. Um, and it's important managing those chronic diseases has become a major initiative for both meaningful use and patient-centered medical home. So we think those will be uh, well attended and appreciated. Uh, we have another uh, session about HIV and HCV, routinizing HIV and HCV testing in FQHCs using innovative, scalable, dual testing model. Um, that's a, a workshop session on Wednesday. And indicative of many of our workshop, workshop sessions, where it's going to be focusing on the actual implementation of this program, what were the steps taken, what were the documents that were uh, created, uh, who were the, uh, the project champions that were involved, the training that was involved. So there's really a hands-on approach with the idea that you could take some of that knowledge back to your health center and replicate these projects. Uh, speaking of which, uh, another workshop activity, patient access and workflow, key to clinician productivity and client satisfaction. Uh, that's another breakout session that we're very excited about. Uh, it's being uh, presented by a consultant with experience in workflow redesign and management. And it's something that we've heard from our member health centers that they really want some assistance with in terms of uh, digging into um, how can we d better design our workflows to support care coordination, to make use of our, um, our medical assistance, our LPNs, um, all, of, all of these workflow redesigns to really maximize productivity 
and um, you know increase the uh, satisfaction of your providers and your clients so that everything is moving as smoothly as, po as possible. Uh, patient management and engagement. We have another workshop uh, session on managing population health, um, evidence-based tools for population health management. Uh, again, this is something that all health centers are going to be looking at going forward. How can you uh, engage in population health activities? What are the tools and resources available to you? And again, this is something that's very important to, um, to health centers as they move forward with their patient-centered medical home uh, recognition. And then just a, a last one that I want to take a, a look at is um, something looking at our, our patient, our public and private partnerships. Um, from uh, TCA Health in Chicago, they'll be presenting on uh, broad-based Affordable Care Act outreach and enrollment strategies for Chicago's public housing families, a public-private collaboration that they were engaged in uh, with the Housing Authority and several other health centers and community groups, and really, a, um, a, again, a replicable model for how health centers can reach out to public and private institutions to increase their reach and their um, engagement with the community for positive health and program outcomes. So uh, really, when it comes to our workshop sessions, our breakout sessions, again, there's a, an emphasis on um, interactive, um, you know, uh, efficient use of time so that we can give you some um, learning objectives and some tools that you can take home to your health center to improve care and, uh, and outcomes. So I think, uh, I think that's uh, about it. Um, I will turn it back over to, uh, to Rachel to point out a few other things related to the symposium. Thank you, Casey. So last year when we had our symposium in Denver, Colorado, we had exceptional sessions, um, really good turnout, and some really great speakers and presenters. And you see here throughout the sessions, we really promote interactive sessions, participatory sessions. We want you to be engaged. We want, we want you to learn in different ways, um, not just sitting down and having PowerPoint presentation in the lecture, but being um, thoroughly stimulated um, through different forms of learning. Um, so you see here we have um, people standing up and doing some type of activity. We have um, some interactive activity um, in the middle with the green cards and post-its. Um, you have your regular discussion. You have the round tables. Um, so it's different ways that you can be engaged and tune in to different channels of thought of learning and all of those. So we're very excited about this upcoming symposium. We really encourage you to join us in Alexandria. Um, moving on to some of our social media activity, and we do have a hashtag for this upcoming symposium, pound PhPC 2014, um, and we have been actively tweeting and using it as a method um, to promote the symposium as well as to connect with others. Very briefly, I want to um, show the website. So this is the this is our Twitter account right here, um, and we just are constantly updating it, and we you know invite you to join us as well using the hashtag. And then here is um, the symposium at a glance, which has the full breakdown of all the information you need to plan and schedule the sessions that you want to attend um, beforehand, before you even get to the symposium. Um, and so as, as we mentioned, it's two and a half days. And here's all the information about the sessions. At the registration site, you're able to register here, as well as contact um, me or someone from Community Health Partners for Sustainability about any questions you may have. Um, this is our list of confirmed speakers. And the agenda is complete and full, so this is the most up-to-date and relevant information that you'll need um, to prepare for the symposium. Um, and so we have additional information about accommodation. So this is kind of the portal that you need to use to connect um, at any time throughout the planning process as well as when you get to the symposium. A lot of your questions can be answered on this site. Um, so going back to the presentation, um, we now have uh, Ms. Cynthia Davis, who will be sharing some of her experiences with us. 
Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Cynthia Davis, and I'm the Director of Community Outreach. Well, now I'm a director thanks to the symposiums that I've been going to since 2009. Um, I don't know if this is going to be your first time or anyone's first time. I know that it not only helped me, but these workshops helped the floating hospital as well. Back in 2009, the floating hospital was awarded $1.3 million from Obama administration to actually open up a health care center. I was approached by the president to become an outreach manager. I had no idea on how I was going to start outreaching to public housing residents and to the community at large. So someone actually sent the email and invited me to come to the health care for the residents of public housing. Back then, it was called the National Training Conference. Now it's the symposium. So my first conference that I went to, actually all the workshops, all the keynote speakers, all the hands-on materials that I brought home allowed me to set up an outreach department. It was a pilot program for the, out, um, the project. Excuse me. It allowed me to have the tools to set up for the pilot, the pilot program here at the floating hospital. Um, I went to all the breakout sessions. I went to mostly every workshop. Everything is self-explanatory once you get your schedule. Um, everything is pretty much, if you just now start an outreach, this is the key to your success. I've been going since 2009. Since 2009, um, my first year of outreaching in 2009 to public housing um, residents was 908 services. As of last year, since going to the um, symposiums and learning about outreaching, um, we cleared 10,000 services. And the reason being is because these breakout sessions, listening to other people from other parts of the state, different type of public housing. The public housing here in New York is different to the one that's in Baltimore, different than the one in Denver. So getting all these resources and bringing it home helped me be successful and the floating hospital be successful as well. Also, I want to say when you do go to the symposium and you do have residents from different parts of the state, actually join in with them, have lunch with them, talk to them, because they will give you the key that you really need to outreach to that particular um, population. Also, by going to these conferences, it built not only my confidence, but also my managing tools, time management. I, that was the best workshop that I went to was the time management workshop. It was like a hands-on workshop. And I still use those tools to this day. Um, uh, what else could I say about the workshop, the conference? I mean, it's just like something that's it's gold. It's gold. Uh, that's all I can say. It's gold that your agency will need in order to succeed. Also, I'm going to these workshops. It also allowed me to become a manager to become a director. Also received two proclamations of Community Outreach Excellence Award by the Assemblywoman, um, by the council person. Um, we also involved, the floating hospitals also involved now, not only providing the services, we know how to partner now with the residents, which is a big key. It's not just about outreach. outreaching. Like someone said earlier, you actually come in, you make the um, residents feel comfortable. You could come here and not only get your health care services, but a place to feel safe. And I can go on and on and on about how important it is to get everyone to come to the symposium. It's, it's, it's just gold. That's all I can say. If you want to succeed, you just really have to come to the symposium. So anybody have any questions? I'll be more than happy to answer. Oh, thank you, Cynthia, for that information. Um, we will have a Q&A portion at the end, but now we'll go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Little. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be a part of this symposium. Symposium, As you know, there is a what I refer to as a web of entanglement in many communities across the country. Imagine that you walk out of your door in the morning and you run right into a spider web. And there's a tendency for all of us to extend our hands to get the web out of our face. But the web represents a series of things that go on in communities that are uncomfortable. And in so many of the communities that could benefit immensely from this country are communities where many families do not have immediate 
access to fresh fruits and vegetables through the market uh, establishments. There are not adequate facilities for recreation, to for exercising, and uh, the other things that keep us in shape. Uh, where the social cancers, uh, the disparities that cause many groups to have a shortened uh, lifespan are much, much more severe than other communities and where many families and individuals are not connected to primary care providers. So we can't overemphasize the importance of a conference where the consumer is at the table as it is uh, at this annual symposium. Having the consumer at the table says that the consumer, public housing families and residents have a voice of worth in the decision-making process about quality of services, types of services, uh, how to engage residents and uh, members of the community, and how to use uh, information from consumers to improve upon outreach and recruitment strategies so that we are very, very effective in growing the size of the consumer group who will use uh, centers to improve their health and the overall quality of life. The symposium over the years, and I've been uh, fortunate to attend more years than I can remember, but um, the symposium uh, is an opportunity to do tremendous capacity building. The relationships that are built by resident council officers with leaders and stakeholders from other parts of the country, uh, from di diverse disciplines and concentrations allow them uh, to benefit from that information to be effective ground troops in public housing developments in the larger community around organizing the advocacy programs and efforts and it equips them to really be uh, effective ground troops. The enhancement to the mindset about uh, the care of the body, uh, and all of the things that are important to be a well-rounded person from a health standpoint, mental health, physical health, you know, et cetera, uh, is what I think is frequently the byproduct of the sessions, of the demonstrations, the information that uh, attendees get, and increasingly uh, more leaders, resident leaders from public housing are using the uh, uh, symposium as a forum to empower them themselves so that uh, they can be effective counsels in the work that they do uh, back at home in the communities uh, as they work directly uh, with families. Um, I, I think also uh, consistently the sim symposium has been a way to promote evidence best practices unless you hear about them, talk to individuals who uh, designed and who implement them. It's so easy to exist in different parts of the country and not know what are the things that are working best for whom and under what particular circumstances. And when we invest time and efforts in an intervention, there needs to be confidence that the practice um, that there's the evidence that the practice does indeed work. So the symposium has consistently proven to be a source to learn more about evidence-based practices in a range of areas, and that's phenomenal empowerment for community leaders. We can treat the symposium also as really a, um, a place for leadership development um, to become I think an increasingly effective partner in the public health, public health and primary health care movement, and I call it a movement, in that until we get a center at every public housing development in this country, we haven't finished growing and expanding. Um, the health and wellness of individuals cannot be overemphasized, and the importance of leadership development to have a um, 
trained set of individuals who are sensitive to, who understand, and who are committed to uh, ground troop task or either community-based task to keep alive and to ensure that families have those resources, those health resources, and are connected to providers uh, is just an important leadership responsibility. And so often, many around the country see a resident council as a group that does other things or things that have very little to do with quality of life. In fact, uh, NARSA promotes and pushes and teaches uh, the importance of leadership development in areas that impact quality of life for families. Because the bottom line is that if we have strong individuals, strong families, strong communities, we also have strong states and strong, a very strong nation. The dotted lines are connected with the kind of leadership that we provide and the impact of that leadership on strengthening families. And lastly, I think I can say that um, I've been witness to the fact and the feedback from thousands of residents that I talk to annually and other conferences that I attend around the country that uh, the symposium provides an opportunity for advocacy and for preparation for public policy discussion. When the consumer, when resident council leaders and residents of public housing uh, are empowered to the extent that they can be an advocate for improved quality of health care uh, and uh, health practices amongst families, that's such an important direction to go. But also when we go in that direction, we have to be sure that the public policy that drives funding, that drives the principles around what foundations do that have a lot to do with all of those elements that speak to uh, having in place the rules and regulations and the resources to uh, ensure that communities have the resources and programs that they need, and it takes good advocacy work, it takes an understanding of the perplex and complex issues sometimes, and the ability to articulate it and to know who to get to, who to communicate with, what to talk about so that um, families that have special needs are not neglected and that we as a society uh, really carry out our social responsibilities and obligations to ensure that um, uh, there are the right programs and services in communities to enhance and improve the quality of life. And this is just a sampling, but I think the impact that the symposium has for resident leaders of public housing is a tremendous impact, and in its absence, wow, what a big question mark I would have. Thank you so much, Dr. Little, for sharing um, and providing so much insight. Um, such a motivational speaker we have here. Um, and just continuing on with the theme of the symposium, as you see here, we welcome um, residents attending. We welcome community members attending, health centers, um, health care providers, safety net providers, um, leaders in the community at the national, state, and federal levels in order to address this issue, because it can't just be health centers alone addressing the issue of health disparities in low income and substandard housing. So we need everybody, every individual who is in the healthcare setting and working with populations to attend and to, as you know, Dr. Little said, be an advocate for this population, as well as to be the person to train them and empower them to advocate for, them, advocate for themselves as well. Um, so we're very excited as we keep saying about the symposium, but um, just to cover some basic logistics, like I said, at our registration site, you can find more information about registering um, the symposium at a glance, hotel accommodations, and any type of updates to the symposium. As I mentioned before, it is June 10th through 12th, two and a half days in beautiful Alexandria, Virginia, um, and we will be excited to see you there. We also would like to thank our sponsors, um, and you will see the United Health Foundation specifically United Community and State during the lunch plenary with HUD. Um, and then you'll see some of our other sponsors and exhibitors, and we really hope that you also will visit their tables and their booths as well. 
um, from all of the staff um, at the National Center for Health and Public Housing and Community Health Partners for Sustainability, we thank you for joining our webinar. And we would like to open it up now for Q&A. So if you have a question, we just ask that you type it into the box to your right in your toolbox. And we'll forward those questions over to our panelists. Um, so one question um, for the two panel members that we have. Um, what are you looking forward to most at this year's symposium? If you had to list just or name one thing. Can you repeat that? Because something came up when you were speaking. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I was saying, um, what would you name as something that you're looking forward to most at the upcoming symposium? Oh, networking. Networking. I know yes. that's always a great one. Yes, Dr. networking. Little? Yes, networking. And the reason why I said that, because of my first um, symposium that I went to back in 2009, the floating hospital was in the midst of opening up the first community health center in the public housing setting. And we was having a really hard time. We didn't know the people who to really speak to. And NYCHA just so happened to perch in Mr. Richard Wright, who was sitting up in on your panel from NYCHA, actually helped us. So mm -hmm. the networking is very powerful there. Excellent. Yeah, and we definitely welcome the presence of PCAs. Um, so Dr. Little, what would you, or what are you anticipating? Mine would focus around uh, increased opportunity for capacity building. I'm on this capacity building uh, war, <laughs> if you will, <laughs> and I say, say that in a positive way, that the, the efforts must be nonstop in disenfranchised communities and with individuals that uh, have been excluded from uh, those opportunities that can improve the quality of health and life for families generally. So the better we are at helping the cohort of attendees do ground capacity building work. And I'm looking forward to finding additional and innovative ways to do that, to build the bun upon them, sorry, the, the base of activities and strategies that are currently used. Great, excellent. And just a question for each of you. Will you be bringing any residents um, of public housing to the symposium with you? I've actually been promoting the conference um, uh, for a couple of months now around the country as I've traveled to other conferences. Uh, uh, just as an example, is up in Massachusetts, the Massachusetts Union of Public Health and Tennis Conference. Uh, last week promoted the conference there. Uh, you may get some attendees from Massachusetts, uh, from New York City. I was there from um, New Orleans. Uh, and uh, next week we'll be in Tennessee at the Tennessee Community Assistance Corporations Conference and we'll promote uh, this symposium there equally as well. Great. Wow. That's fantastic. Um, so far the Floating Hospital, we're going to actually bring in um, one of our board members because she, I talk about the symposium all the time. She wants to see up front in hand, you know, all the workshops on how we can start an implement another program here at the Florida Hospital. Second thing, I'm the second person I'm going to bring is the president of the Resident Association for Queensbridge Houses, which we all know Queensbridge Houses is one of the largest public housing here in the United States. So she's going to actually come, and I'm still awaiting two residents that we invited as well to come along with us and our team um, to come out to the symposium. And I'm also inviting our new um, outreach coordinator who just started two weeks ago, and she's going to be attending as well. Wow, great. It seems like you'll have a <clears throat> large group coming with you as well. And um, last question. At the community forum, which issues do you think must be addressed in that forum um, and with that particular group of individuals who will be gathered there? That's a hot topic around the country. I'm picking up as I've attended conferences over the past few months, and it has to do with cultural sensitivity. Uh, we have to be 
are cognizant of, sensitive to, appreciate and value the diversity of individuals culturally and in other ways and be prepared to serve them well, include them uh, in discussions. Uh, so I you know, think if some emphasis could be placed on uh, enhancing how to handle cultural diversity um, in a very innovative but appropriate way, I think would be good for those who are working with increasing a very diverse population. That is so correct. Yes, because we have that issue right now here in Queensbridge. And we out here in Long Island City, which is Queens, is one of the largest um, places with the diversity. It's over 128 languages. I don't know how many cultures, so I do agree with um, Dr. Little. Also, I think we should really enhance upon is the oral health care in public housing. Um, there's not enough um, education out here about oral health. So mm -hmm. I think that could be a great topic as well. Yeah, and definitely one that needs additional funding. Um, and hopefully, because we will have HRSA alongside a additional um, federal speakers, that they'll speak to some of the funding opportunities out there for expanded services and integration into primary care. So I feel that we will have a lot to discuss, um, and a lot will be surrounded around partnerships, around funding, and innovation, as well as cultural sensitivity. So once again, I would like to thank everyone for joining the call today. Um, we will send out the slides as well as the video recording of this session for you to review later as well as forward to any contacts of colleagues that you would like to join you at this upcoming symposium. And for any questions or issues, please feel free to contact me. And I will also include contact information for Casey um, as well when I send out the email. So thank you to our presenters and panelists. And thank you to everyone who attended. Thank you very, very much. Thank Good you. Afternoon. Thank you, everybody. Goodbye. Good night.